Yeah, so um, I've done a number of things. Um, I figure when I've completely solved human genetics, it's time to move on to something else. So, but, but we haven't caught, we're not quite there yet. Um, and uh, I have a, a joke about GCHQ, which stands for Government Communications Headquarters. Uh, we just didn't say which governments we were talking about. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, um, this is very much... Uh, the, the stuff I'm talking about today is a technology which, um, oh, is probably in some form in, in uh, David Reich's lab, which is where I mostly work, uh, nearly a decade old. That makes it uh, really fairly mature, by the way, things go in genetics. But, um, and so this is very much an introductory talk. I, in fact, there were a number of things I wanted to talk about today, and I looked at the what was involved and looked at the time available and decided I just had to leave them out. So um, uh, there's a lot more here than I'm going to say. And I would like to begin with an advertisement. If any of you clever people uh, want interesting uh, mathematical, computational, or statistical problems in this area, uh, come and talk. Um, I'm not short of things I want to do and don't know how. Okay, so let's see how we get on here. Good. All right. So um, I, um, I'm talking about something uh, I call F-statistics. It's probably a terrible name. Um, and um, in an early paper, a reviewer said well, you should call them something else because there's confusion with FST and so on. Um, actually, I called them F-statistics because they sort of are vaguely reminiscent of FST, if you know about that. Um, but the trouble is with these things, by the time you really write up the theory, there's four papers out there that are already using the notation, and it's impossible to change. So we're, we're kind of stuck. Um, so I don't like the name so much, but this is how it's going to be. So they're sort of a little bit like Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And uh, just for confusion, I often use F, capital F, uh, 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 as but well. That's even worse. Yes, right. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> well, is it, this is something that happens in mathematics, right? I, I once gave a lecture where someone came up rather quietly at the end and said, Nick, um, you used like 15 symbols uh, during your lecture, and all of them were S. There was, <laughs> there was small S, capital S, sigma, you know, <laughs> script S. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's how mathematicians tend to work. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm, uh, I want to talk about some basic mathematical genetics. Um, you know, the balance of um, gravity uh, in uh, the Broad Institute in genetics is massively on the medical side. So uh, population genetics and the theory of population genetics gets a little bit of short shrift, I think. And this is very much, you know, population genetics is all we're doing. Uh, there are medical applications lurking here, but that's not really the point at all. Um, the point is we're trying to learn about, um, about history, and uh, particularly human history. Um, all I'm going to talk about is humans, but um, I will say I did get, in an early incarnation of the software, I got an, e uh, an email which was very sensible. He said, Nick... Um, your, uh, your software assumes there are 22 autosomes, but I'm working on cattle. <laughs> so we, we fix that. No, that's... Uh, no? Um, all right. Um, okay. So here's some... Um, uh, I'm not going to talk terribly much about the basic theory, but you should have this lurking at the back of your mind. Um, so the basic idea is we have some population... Um, Two populations, X and Y, and we X is an ancestor population of Y. Um, so it's about as simple a demographic event as you could imagine. And um, we have an allele frequency, little x for in the X population, little y for the Y population. Okay. Um, so um, some ground rules in everything I want to do. Um, is there a, here we are, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write here, um, ground rules, uh, no selection, so the, the jargon in population genetics uh, is neutral drift, 
uh, no double mutations, and uh, no uh, back mutations. Back mutation means that somewhere in history we had, a, we had an allele A that changed to allele B, and then a little later on it changed back to A. <laughs> right? Not allowed that. I'm a mathematician, so I get to make my rules. Right? <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, it's interesting. It often happens in science that um, uh, one person's gold is the other one's junk and the other way around, right? I mean, there are lots of people here very, very interested in selection, and the neutral areas are kind of boring. But for, when I'm doing population genetics, I'm mostly interested in the neutral areas because I'm interested in what's happened with demographic changes, and I can do the math much more simply when it's neutral than when it's selection. So from my point of view, the neutral areas of the gold and the selection, at least in the context of this talk, is the, is the junk. Okay. By the way, um, I'm infinitely, if you, please, please interrupt. I, I'll be not happy if I don't get a single question in the course of this talk. All right. Okay. Um, so, um, the point is, when you go along this edge here, um, we're just getting uh, what geneticists call drift. Um, so generation by generation, the allele frequencies slowly change. And the key fact is that the expected value of little y is x, which, if you know about stochastic processes, means that the um, allele frequencies as you move down here are a martingale. Right. Huh? That's um, the basic pop gen fact, which uh, is what most of this stuff relies on fairly implicitly. So, um, uh, so um, uh, since this is true for y, it's also true for z. And so um, uh, the expected value of x minus y and x minus z is 0. And indeed, the expected value of y minus z is 0. Um, uh, because for whatever x is, that's true, right? Huh? So very, very simple stuff, but um, we can make a... I've sort of made my living at some level for a lot of the last 10 years simply exploiting this fact in, in multiple guises. It's so far so good? What about the last equation? How does that work? Um, oh, uh, it's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. It's uh, What I should have said is x... Uh, uh, just a moment, just a moment. Um, yes, conditional, conditioned on x, conditioned on, sorry, it's right, conditioned on x, um, this value is, is, is this, this bracket is correct, and the drift here and the drift here are, inde are independent. So everything is fine. The, um, so conditionally on x, these are independent, and so integrate on x, you get this thing. Okay, good. Um, well, I had a moment of panic. Uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah. Um, so uh, I will, I'm sort of rambling and telling a, a, a absurd stories of academia. So when I wrote this stuff up, it's funny, and everyone comes from their own world. I talked about uh, drift on different edges being orthogonal random variables. And I get this review that says, why are you using weird phrases, like weird non-standard phrases, like orthogonal random variables? So my response was, I Google it, and there are 11,000 references. <laughs> but you know, everyone's in their own little world with their own language, and it's, that makes communication quite difficult. OK. Huh? Okay, okay, so um, the, if you want to go further in this, and this isn't actually up to date, though it's covering pretty much everything I'm talking about today, um, there's a paper, which I'm the lead author, Ancient Admixture in Human History, uh, it's 2012 Genetics, and um, there's a substantial package, uh, which is up to date, called Admix Tools, which you can get from GitHub, uh, and the uh, um, information is on the, the Right Lab software page. All right, so I want to talk about three things uh, this morning. I want to talk about uh, what we call the F4 test, um, 
and lengthening uh, D statistics, uh, which is a test for whether you actually have a tree phylogeny at all. Um, I want to talk about the F3 test, which is a test for admixture and different. And I want to, rather briefly, although it could actually be a lecture by itself, I want to talk about fitting a full phylogeny uh, with a program I call QP graph. Um, so uh, this package, Admix Tools, um, has been um, a real workhorse. Yes, question about it. Sorry, Nick, can you just tell us an alternative to a tree phylogeny? Yeah, you will see, <laughs> right? The question is, um, uh, uh, is the description of your species or populations uh, just um, reasonably described by splitting uh, in a, a directed tree uh, with no funky stuff after the splits, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer, by and large, is no. <laughs> And, uh, and well, there are we examples of, of uh, where, 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 treat, where the phylogeny fails. Um, OK. Um, so um, this package has been really a workhorse for the lab. Um, I would say pretty much every paper <coughs> that David Reich's lab has written um, uses this in a pretty central way, though it's certainly not the only technique. And it's really spread around the population genetics community now. So. Um, uh, I, I, I don't even keep track of how many, uh, how many papers use this stuff. And uh, some sign of it, which is a pain in the ass, of course, is, a, is emails saying, Dear Nick, I tried to use your software and it didn't work. <laughs> you know, I get lots of those. <laughs> uh, some are sensible and some are not, and you look into it. <laughs> OK. All right. So, so let's talk about F statistics to start with. So I've got. A, B, C, D in caps are populations uh, with, allele, with alleles having frequencies, little a, b, c, and, c and d. Um, something that's not, something's interesting and relevant is, um, I'm only talking about bile, I should have put on that, but I'm only talking about biallelic SNPs. Um, there's some theory that's relevant to multi-allelic things like CNVs, but I'm not going to talk about that at all this time. We're talking about biallelic SNPs. So we have a, what I, people talk about reference and variant alleles, and I really like to talk about the count allele, that there's an allele we're counting, and then there's the other guy. And um, it's not important for the F statistics um, which allele you pick to count, which is technically quite helpful. Um, OK, so um, I'm now going to define a parameter uh, of the situation, uh, which is the um, expected value of a minus b and c minus d. Okay, it's just definition. And um, the point here is, you are if you're just reading this quickly, you're probably thinking that a, b, and c, and d are all different. But I never said that, and that's not, imp not, not, that's not necessary. So... Um, if A, B, C, and D are indeed all different, you've got four populations, and this thing is an F4 statistic, or, or at least an estimate of it will be a statistic. Um, if only three of the populations are, are different, uh, we get an F3 statistic, and you probably can guess what an F2 statistic is. Okay. Um, all right. When you say expected value, yeah, uh -huh. what's the probability model you have? Okay, uh, very good question, and um, I um, uh, think that there's an implicit phylogeny generated by God. The Bayesians are very religious, right? <laughs> and uh, and um, God generated the phylogeny and then generated allele frequencies in, for a particular SNP um, as random variables. Um, under that phylogeny. And if, and if that's not very precise, it's not meant to be. Fine. But okay. then the, that, that the empirical distribution is realized by running over all these things, sort of. Well, it's averaging. Well, no, God, God, God is, we're looking at a particular set of SNPs. Each one has this random variable. Yeah. Right? And we're now going to estimate the expectation. Okay. Um, that's, there's subtleties here. Uh, if you really care about this, I have an unpublished note called What is FST? 
which is related here. And um, that note um, goes into some detail about what the expectations are. And just as an example, um, FST, which is generally thought of as a population statistic, um, in fact, is dependent on the sets of SNPs you use. And you really need to worry about that if you're being careful. OK. All right. So, um, OK. So um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm doing fine for that. I'm talk, I want to talk about F4. Um, OK. So um, if you have, uh, so there's only, there's only one uh, unrooted, unlabeled tree that has four leaves. And I just drew it. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. And if you uh, want to label uh, the leaf nodes, uh, there's three labelings. Um, which um, roughly um, pick A, pick the partner for B, which you can obviously do three ways, and then the order here doesn't matter. Right. So you have three unlabeled trees. Okay. All right. So um, let's pick. Let's look at this. Let's look at this labeling. So all your trees are always three regulated. Like there's never a branch with four. Uh, that's not in. That's not necessary for the theory, but I mean... Well, you say there's only one tree. Okay, you're right, thank you, yes, okay, you're right. I, I will always, um, all splits are, are, um, like two are, 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 I don't call them, bi-splits or something. Yeah, yeah. They're just, uh, um, uh, the theory sort of works without that, but I, I'm not going to go there. All right, anyway, let's suppose, let's suppose that this is... Um, uh, this is the true tree, and I haven't put the root in. It doesn't matter. That's part of the point. Um, then, um, let's, let, but just for definiteness, let's, let's suppose the root is somewhere in the middle edge, or right here somewhere. Then, um, uh, um, whatever, you, there's a hidden population frequency here you don't get to see, but whatever this population frequency is, um, A minus B, uh, should have expectation zero, because they both have to match what's here. Right. So what you see is that if you go in and look at m multiple SNPs and compute uh, this empirical mean, then up to statistical noise, uh, this ought to be zero. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the test. We test the tree, we compute... We compute F4, averaging over uh, many SNPs. This is typically done on genotype arrays, though you can also do it on sequence data. Um, and then you want to, so you, you, you get a cystic, and then you want to know, um, is this value significantly different from zero? And so you need to compute a standard uh, error. And um, of course, there's LD in the data, so what do you do? And the answer is, um, uh, I, uh, a technique which is now fairly standard in the literature, and as it happens, there's a meeting tomorrow <laughs> talking about uh, some issues there, um, which is the block jackknife. Um, actually, I claim, this is funny, um, this is actually a fairly standard te technique in statistics, but I claim credit for doing it in genetics, if you know, I don't know what epsilon credit there is. Um, you had this problem with dealing with LD, and the jackknife is a good and computationally very efficient way of... Um, I particularly like it because it's dead easy to code, and I'm a lazy guy. <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to talk. You know, there's a whole other talk on the block jackknife, and, 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 and uh, I, I don't want to talk about that at all. But you should believe that I can compute decent standard errors for, for this quantity. Mm -hmm. so, so you leave a chunk of the data out, one chunk at a time. Yeah. So um, what you do? I mean, just waving, just really wave waving my hands. Yeah. Um, I take. I take my default is five megabase blocks because in most data, uh, LD uh, extends way less than that. So you take five megabase blocks, um, you um, uh, delete the block, uh, you compute um, uh, the statistic on the deleted data. Um, typically, you know, on, on a typical genotype array on autosomes, I have something like 700 blocks. So you wind up with 700 values of the statistic. Um, they're obviously far from independent, um, because they're pretty much they're all overlapping enormously. But there's a magic, so you then compute 
the standard error as though they were independent, and there's a magic factor that John Tukey invented uh, um, that tells you how to correct that, and there you are. So it's really, uh, it really is dead easy to code, and the, 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 the only trick is the magic factor, and the theory tells you how to do that. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, so what is the precise uh, like null hypothesis here? Like, what are you actually testing? Well, I, I'm testing, uh, let's, let's be a little bit, if, with a rooted tree, that would be clear, right? That, um, suppose I have a rooted tree, I have drift lengths um, on each edge, mm? right? And this is the phylogeny, right? Then I claim, this is zero and I have a test. That answer the question? Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is the tree, but like these four parts. Yes, uh, yes, hypothesis, these, this is the tree, you do the test. Okay, so... We can, uh, I just told, I told you there were three trees, so you try them all, right? Huh? And um, uh, um, uh, it turns out that um, uh, this population is one, two, three, and four. Um, what you're actually doing is counting the frequency of what I call BABA events. Uh, BABA means population one and population three have the same allele. Population two and population four have the same allele, and uh, one and two are different, right? So it's just an allele pattern. If I just pick a random allele in the four populations, is the pattern BABA? And if you understand what BABA is, you should understand what ABBA is, right? Huh? Okay, so we just do the algebra. This is what this, is what this thing is. And uh, a minor refinement, which seems actually to make very little difference, is when you think about it, the total sum here um, is not informative as to whether A and B are clade, right? So this denominator is irrelevant to the question you're asking, and it's logical, if you're a statistician, to normalize by the irrelevant information. In a certain sense, you're conditioning out what you don't care about. Um, but what is the meaning of clade? In this okay. Well, clade. Oh, well, clade is population jet jargon. Clade means I've got a bunch of populations. I've got another bunch of populations, right? And the demography of the second bunch had nothing to do with the first bunch after the split, right? Mm? That's that's really the thing. So is each of those bunches a clade? Uh, no, but well, it, um, yes, uh, if, it, um, uh, if they're all leaf, no leaf nodes, right? But in, in fact, with ancient DNA, you could even have an ancestral population up there, so it's... So, a clade so, thing, or so look, look, as, look, as an example, in a, a, a trivial model for um, demography is much too simple, but we have an out-of-Africa... Let's imagine we have Africa, we have an out-of-Africa event... So you have an out of Africa population, and then Eurasia splits up. Right? Very simple, right? So Eurasia is a clade, right? With respect to Africa, and indeed with respect to the out of Africa population, because it's not influencing anything at all after the, the Eurasian split. Right? Okay. Anyway, um, uh, okay. So, um, so here's some, ex here's some examples of, um, we, um, uh, we take Yoruba Nigerians, which all of you will yeah. know about. Yeah. Can you motivate the D statistics a little more? Yeah. Oh. When you went yeah. from the F to the D, it was clear. Like it, it's not terribly important. But, but what's um, the D thing about? Well, the point is, you look at this denominator. denominator. I've got, I'm interested in, the, in testing cladedness. I want to know if Baba and Abba um, actually are occurring at different frequencies. So what, what do you? So before you were testing treeness, and then you were saying like, okay, well, which of the trees, or can I rule out all of them? And now, what are you testing? I'm testing the same thing. Okay. Right. It's just a, it's a slightly different test. I'm going to count Babu and Abba events, right? But I'm simply going to ask myself. Um, I, I claim that the sum here is not telling me anything at all about whether there's a clay, right? I mean, I'm interested in the difference here. Therefore, a reasonable thing to do is to simply look at the f relative frequency of BABA and ABBA conditioned on one or the other happening. If you had independent data, this, will, this should be binomial half. Right? Huh? Okay. Right? But, of course, you know, there's the usual LD stuff. Right? Now, I will say this is not terribly important. Um, the, uh, my software 
allows you to compute D or F4 and test it. And in my opinion, D is fractionally theoretically superior. And in practice, I've gotten a seen very little advantage. And roughly, what's the null distribution that you expect for D? Binomial. Binomial. With a variance that has to be determined from LD. Okay. Right? Uh, right? That's just related to the number of effectively independent. Yes, that's right. It's like, it's like I sample, it's like I toss a coin, but somehow successive tosses are, are correlated in a way I don't completely understand. Right? That's, uh, no? All right. Um, okay. So. And, sorry, and the test is still about. Yeah, I can. No, 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 no. Well, the, 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 the line one test is, is D believably zero? Right? But under what condition do you expect D to be zero? It's the condition that they're clade. That they're yeah. So, all right. So, so now, but to play it as in. You know, talk, yeah, the leads of. Yeah, and, you know, two, we have these, I'm testing two populations. And, uh, the, the, um, all right. So, uh, so here we, uh, now I'm going to press on a little bit. So Yorubi, you know about, this is a group of North European populations. Han, Han Chinese, you know about those. Uh, the, these are um, South African uh, foragers and a very interesting and important population, population geneticists. So I, so I compute my 3D statistics. I compute a, a Z-score. And uh, um, you see that two of them are ridiculously large. And the third is, uh, is, is, not, a, is not problematic. Um, so grouping the two African populations, the two Eurasian populations together, uh, is, is working fine in, in, in this simple test. Uh, but now let's take another example. This time I'm going to replace the San with uh, Papua New Guinea Highlanders. And uh, another perfectly good Eurasian population. And you see that the, the best z-score is 8 sigma, right? So life is complicated here. I mean, you, what you've proved is you take these four populations, right? They aren't, uh, there, there's no tree there. Can't be, no? Right. Um, so at this point, you have to think about what you, what, 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 what's going on. But you've definitely proved that the tree is, the tree is bust. Right. Um, okay, so here's some more examples. Um, I'm, I, I just want to give you the, the Adige are a population in the Caucasus Mountains. Um, they're West Eurasian. Dai, um, Dai are Southwest Chinese. Um, I like to use these. Their the genetic history seems to be a little simpler than Han Chinese, which actually have quite a complex history with gene flow both in South China and from, and from the North. And it's, it's uh, interesting, but a different topic. The Ongi of a population we're extraordinarily lucky to have data from, which is an indigenous population from the Andaman Islands. Um, this is really a, um, a Stone Age culture which has been isolated for tens of thousands of years. Um, and the Karatiana are an Aboriginal population from Brazil, which um, uh, turns out that they'd be important to other things I'm going to say. And uh, you see, um, it's trouble. I mean, you can't. Um, um, uh, um, uh, this one might be all right, and it's saying something about Asian ancestry in, into the Americas. But um, some of these other cases are obviously um, the tree model is just bust. All right. Okay. Um, and here's a very important example. Uh, Altai is a Neanderthal. Um, uh, found in, uh, in, in the Altai Mountains, and Denisova is this amazing uh, fossil, which is just a, um, a one little segment of a pinky bone, and uh, we got more um, DNA from the pinky bone than all the Neanderthals ever been looked at. Quite astonishing. Um, and it's, a, it's an archaic human, but not a Neanderthal. And so you look at this, and um, uh, there's no reason you can use chimp as an outgroup here, which is con technically convenient. And Mabuti are uh, Central uh, Africans from uh, Central Africa, which I like to use because they're, they're rather isolated genetically. And um, when you look at the 
statistics you're getting here, um, is, this is evidence which is, turns out to be correct with multiple arguments, that there's gene flow from the Altai Neanderthal into French. So the French are admixed with the Neanderthal DNA, but the Mabuti are not. Um, um, uh, so um, this, this tree, in other words, isn't quite, this tree is bust, and to fix it, you need to add gene flow from here, this edge to this edge. Hmm? Nick, uh, how can you tell the difference between not a tree because there was gene flow versus like there was selection or some other? Well, in some level you can't. I mean, um, if you were so unlucky that there was independent selection across the genome, right, um, at a pretty massive level, right, um, that could look like drift, right? I think we have no examples that are even remotely credible for that. But mathematically, you're absolutely right. Hmm? Do you also restrict to relatively common alleles where you expect it to drift that ways the selection unless the selection was really enormous? Or? Well, you know, remember we're doing genome-wide averaging. So, I mean, do you know any cases where there's really, you know, genome-wide selection on, uh, you know, or when you just put random snips in almost anyhow? So, but, but to, to answer um, Alex's uh, question, um, uh, if you choose SNPs, and we're still exploring this, uh, Stefan Schiffels is a very brilliant population geneticist in Jena, is thinking very hard about this. And suppose I pick SNPs where the derived allele frequency is low, um, then what I'm going to be doing is looking at history that's relatively recent. Uh, most rare alleles are, are new, right? So I'm looking back um, at a relatively recent in time. What I'm typically doing here is just taking SNPs that happen to be on a gene array, most of which are common, right? And so I'm looking in deep time. And the, 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 this is cutting edge, and we're not really, we're still exploring exactly uh, what, what that, how to do that. Um, when you say this is strong evidence for this particular gene flow, that's no. not, what, what is the evidence? Well, which, which is the well, you do, well, you know there's a tree. You have, to get, um, you have to get flow between the Neanderthal and the, and the Eurasian, right, uh, somehow. And you start just thinking about this. For example, suppose I put flow from the French into the Neanderthal. Right? Well, that would certainly give me this statistic. That would give me a, a positive uh, st a statistic, but um, it wouldn't affect the Denisovan flow, right? I mean, if you think about this, this is the tree that you sort of, this is the null tree. If I have, if after the split, I have flow from this into this, it doesn't affect, the, 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 it doesn't affect this branch, right? Huh? So basically, you stare at this, and the parsimonious solution, which certainly needs confirmation, is that is is this is the argument, is the thing. So we did this. We believe this was the answer. Then if you look at the paper, um, uh, David Reich has a little tick, which you can, you can, if you read a paragraph which says, we present three lines of evidence. It was written by David Reich. <laughs> and we present three lines of evidence here. <laughs> huh? If you leave the French out, do you get an all statistic? Uh, Yes, uh, and uh, in fact, I uh, yeah, uh, that's absolutely. Um, so um, all right. So now I want to. I'm running a little slow here. I, I um, but now I want to talk about the three population test, and this is um, this is actually. Uh, I think the four population test is actually something that was sort of known. I mean, it's not really. The, the, the idea of testing a clade by looking for the no systematic difference is very obvious. This is actually a little bit more subtle, I think. So, um, suppose I have a tree, like, a, a directed tree, I, I, do, I, I, I look at like, look like this. Then it's easy to see that the expected value of C minus A times C minus B um, uh, is, is, is non-negative. And why is that? Well, um, if you think about it, um, we're looking at, um, you can, there's a calculation that's, um, after a while, you, you can do it uh, extremely fast in your head, even with very complicated graphs. Um, for C minus A, we're looking at drift between C and R 
and then RNA. That's the only route connecting them. And similarly, C minus B. And you see that there's two paths in common there, and they share the stuff, and that induces this positivity uh, in, the, in, in this thing. So um, I will actually tell you, I mean, you know, this is one of these things in which if I was smarter, I would have just looked at this thing and known that I had a test. But what I actually did was after I'd written the F, my F4 program, I thought, well, it would be amusing to actually compute F3. And I, and I did. And um, there's negative values all over the place that really surprised me. And so I started thinking about that. And that's really what happened. So how does, how does it get to be negative? So the answer is, suppose I have a graph like this, where these dotted edges are supposed to be at mixture events. So uh, alpha plus beta is 1. And what this means is the C prime is a mix of this population and this population with suitable weights. OK. Um, so now I'm going to compute C minus A and C minus B. Well, let me convince you um, that this is now going to be, um, well, let's, let's, let, let's forget about this edge. This, this is a, this, um, this C minus A, C minus B, this is in common, just the same argument. This will produce a positive value. So let's pretend this edge isn't here and the C prime equals C. So we're going to compute C minus A times C minus B. So why is that negative? Well, um, we can think of this, the, these are population frequencies, but we also can think of getting, we get exactly the same value if we just pick random alleles here. So I'm going to pick a random allele here, here for C, um, uh, another one for A, um, pick a, another one in different one, uh, a different a sample from the population also in C and, so, and B and so on. So the ones I picked here are C1 and C2. Well, suppose C1 is here and C2 is here, and I've got to compute C1 minus A and C2 minus B. Well, that's C1 minus A is this drift, C2 minus B is this drift, and they're orthogonal. Right? That's obviously going to be zero. Right? Um, and when you think about it, and if you pick both of them go this way, um, then um, that's also going to be orthogonal because we see C1 minus A is this way, C2 minus B is this, there's independent edges, they've got nothing in common, still be zero. So the only way you get anything interesting is C1 went this way and C2 went this way. Right? Now when I compute C1 minus A, I've got this path here, right? And when I compute C2 minus B, I've got this path here, and it's going the opposite direction. Right? So that, think about that, that introduces, that forces negativity, right? And... Uh, Why did you get to pick two different scenes? Because I'm, that's, the, that's the way it works. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not computing, of course, I'm not computing, um, uh, I, I'm not computing, the, the, I'm not computing on the same sample, I'm computing on a whole population. Okay, anyway, I'm going to leave that. And that's a, if you don't get that, and probably you don't at this point, you should think about it. It's quite neat, really. Is there a reference? Yes, my HNI mixture paper, right, which works this out in more detail than you may altogether want to know. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, and in fact, this, uh, um, uh, slightly generalizing this, now putting this edge back in, um, uh, the, uh, the expect, this expected value is this drift squared. You can't deal, that's just there. Uh, and then alpha beta, which was in fact the probability that I picked those alleles the way I did. And then um, this um, uh, square value here. So, um, so if you're going to get negative values, this has to be small. Alpha beta should not be too small, because, which means that the admixture is substantial. And the difference between these two populations has to be large. OK. All right. So, um, so I, there's a famous data set originally collected um, by Cavalli Sforza. Um, and uh, um, it's become a, sta a standard data set in population genetics. So I ran this on basically all triples 
in the data set. And here are just some examples. So um, the first one is we look at Uyghurs, which is a population today in Western China. And you take source populations, Han Chinese, and any West Eurasian population, French will do. And you get a z-score of minus 73 sigma. And um, I got to say, when I first computed this, I assumed my program was buggy, because nobody gets 73 sigma answers. Uh, it's not buggy. It's really, uh, the, the, the statistic is enormously powerful. Um, and of course, the fact that Uyghurs had West Eurasian ancestry was well known. Um, uh, you pick some Middle Eastern population, it doesn't matter terribly much which. Uh, you pick some East Asian population, it doesn't matter which. And the Hazara are a population currently in Afghanistan. And um, uh, um, amazingly, the Afghans are largely West Eurasian, which explains the, uh, what the Middle East component is. But the Hazara, um, their folklore was that Genghis Khan's troops marched through Afghanistan and le he left behind soldiers who mixed with the resulting population and um, the, that led to the Hazara. And that's obviously what happened, <laughs> right? So this, is a, this has been a population that's fairly isolated genetically in Afghanistan. They're having a pretty hard time today and uh, it's admixed, massively admixed West Eurasian and, and, and East Asian. Um, so the Khosa are a very large group in South Africa with substantial uh, uh, San ancestry, which is known. Um, the, the languages here have these remarkable click sounds, and there are three click sounds in the Khosa language, which are uh, obviously come in from, from that population. So that was known. Um, uh, this one is I, I just put up because I think it's kind of, sort of fascinating, really. The two are a, a tribal population uh, in western China. Uh, they again have West Eurasian, East Asian admixture. And um, the local uh, term for the, for the, by, for used by the Chinese for these people is white Mongols. <laughs> and some of these people even have blonde hair and blue eyes. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so this hasn't been looked at as, uh, as very hard. I'd, I'd very much like to know more about this mixture and date it. Um, the, uh, the West Eurasians in China um, are not colonial. They're, they're very old and uh, very interesting in history. But that's, uh, again, another talk. And I do want to say a little bit about this one. Um, which was knocked me off my chair when I found it. I had no idea what's going on. Um, you take any North European population, you take Sardinians, and you take Aboriginal South Americans, and you get a massive admixture hit. And so what's that? Okay. So, um, uh, I... What it obviously isn't, is a backflow from Aboriginal South America into Europe. Um, that never seemed a very likely explanation. And I came up in my paper uh, with this model. So you've got ancient Europe, which leads to Sardinia, pretty much. Um, and you have a population which uh, we call a ghost population, because we've derived it from data, but we've never seen it, which we called ancestral North, Euro ancestral North Eurasians. Uh, basically, think ancient Siberians. And the point is, some of these people crossed the Bering Straits into the Americas and were the ancestral population of uh, Native Americans. And some of these people moved west across Eurasia and uh, admixed into Northern Europe. So in my 2012 paper, I um, proposed this just on theoretical grounds from modern data. And uh, this graph appeared exactly there. And um, uh, so we must be seeing a trace of ancient gene flow from all of northern Eurasia, uh, from Siberia coming into Britain. Um, well, um, that was you know, quite a striking claim, actually, I think. 
And um, remarkably, a year later, uh, we found this guy. Or I should say, uh, uh, Eski Willerslev in Copenhagen had a fossil in Siberia, uh, 24,000 years old. Uh, it's called Maltabai. It was, I think, uh, like a... Like a, uh, I think he's like a ten-year-old or some boy or something. He has exactly the genetics we predict here. Right? He's ancestral to Siberians, uh, uh, modern Siberians mostly, uh, Native Americans, and also a component of Europe. Um, so um, we found the ghost. Okay, so I want to just say a little bit. I haven't really talked too much. This has been very much a theoretical genetics talk, uh, but I want to say a little bit about how what we now understand, which we really understand this in very considerable detail. Um, this is all from ancient DNA. Um, around three, th let's go back to 3000 BC in Europe. Um, there's none of this Siberian related flow uh, in Europe at that time. Uh, we have tons of data. Um, there's uh, farming is all over Europe, but um, th this gene flow is not there. But um, on the Russian steppes, there are pastoralists. Uh, there's a very important culture to archaeologists called the Yamna. Um, these built, if you, these were people who built uh, tombs with big mounds of earth uh, called kurgans. You may even have seen photos of those. They're pretty spectacular. And there's a complicated uh, under the mount, uh, the earth. There's a complicated uh, layout of the an obviously ritual burial. Um, these people have massive amounts of this uh, Siberian uh, stuff. And then um, in the middle of the third millennium BC, like 2500 BC, there's a massive incursion from the Russian steppe into Europe. Um, it, uh, it looks pretty much like a population placement or very near. A culture that's well known to archeologists called the Corded Ware form. And the, the Corded Ware is Northern Europe um, is like 70% steppe ancestry. Um, it, uh, I mean, I think this, it's very hard to make um, a story in which that happened peacefully. Right. Mm. I mean, I must say, I think it was probably very ugly, and uh, it's the, something's happened, unfortunately, repeatedly in human history. The population moves in, and you kill the men, and you rape the women. And I th think that's probably exactly what happened in, uh, in, at the dawn of Bronze Age Europe. Not, not, not a nice thing at all. Um, and then there's further mixing going on, and that leads to modern European genetics. But that's why modern Europeans have, uh, Northern Europeans especially, though some, some in Southern Europe, uh, have the step ancestry. So that's why we picked up the signal. Um, I am uh, running a little short of time. I, maybe, uh, maybe just about. I just, I'm just going to wave my hands a little bit about this. The, the most complicated program in my package uh, is a program I call QP graph, uh, where you specify a complete phylogeny. Um, so here's just an example. If you can't read it, it doesn't matter much. Um, you have a root population. You um, specify um, the, at least the topology here. Um, all the drift edges, all the admixture edges. Mm? The software attempts to fill in the values mm? and um, produce a fit. Um, all right. Um, the, and the, the integers on the drift edges are some kind of evolutionary time? Yeah, the drift, the, drift, the drift time, what they actually are is the value up to some scaling that, that I, just for presentation, of F2. So I'm interested in the square difference between a free, allele frequency here and here. Okay. Right? Uh, I call that the drift length. Okay, so that's related to FST. Yes. F2 and FST are, are closely related, though I, that's another, okay, another story. And the percentages on the admixture edges? They're what you think. So if you, I don't know if you can read this. This is 63%. 30. This means that this node here is contributing 63%. And this note here, 37% okay. to, the, to the population. Okay. All right. So um, uh, um, there's, this is the most elaborate and powerful program in the package. And um, it's also the one uh, where um, there are the most issues. That, right. Um, what score should I use? 
Um, how do I do the fit? Um, I always have some answers to these questions, and I couldn't, uh, you know, the program wouldn't run. But I'm not satisfied. Um, this is very important and um, not an, at all easy, which is after you've fitted these parameters, um, you'd like to know is your model adequ fitting adequately? Goodness of fit test. Um, really important to do that, and I don't have a good goodness of fit test. Um, one of the difficulties is um, it isn't even clear exactly how many free parameters I have, unfortunately. Um, I, um, I have some rather interesting theoretical ideas for testing the phylogeny, in fact, without fitting at all, using some ideas from algebraic geometry. Um, that's, very, that's not in the package. It's very immature at the moment, but uh, there's interesting possibilities there. Um, if you have a large number of populations, um, the number of graphs that you can build is doubly exponential. Um, and so you probably are not going to want to try them all. And it would be a really good idea to have some method of building the graphs automatically. Um, at the moment, we basically do it by hand, which is not nice. And in spite of all this, um, the program seems to be useful. So um, this is a place where we really need work and help, actually. No? There's problems all over the place. Is it good for verifying that something you think is true is true right now? How, how do you use it now? It's mostly, yes. It, uh, you can, I mean, for example, uh, what you're doing here is you're computing all the F statistics you could do on this graph. And my goodness of fit test, which is not theoretically adequate, um, simply shows you which F statistics don't fit. Right? So often you can reject a graph. Right? You say, well, you did this. There's some 17 sigma F statistic misfitting. You know, you ba well, buddy, you did it wrong, right? That's <laughs> software tells you that. I mean, um, so um, that's one of the uses, um, and there are others. And um, I will say, um, I've, I'm, as I thought, I'm essentially out of time. There are other programs in this package I haven't even talked about, in particular. There's a program called QPADM for um, testing and um, estimating admixture um, uh, values, which has proven very useful and um, requires only a partial phylogeny. One of the problems with QP graph is there's, there's a piece of, of, of human history that you're trying to understand, and there are these ancestral populations that you need to specify because you know they're relevant, but you're not terribly interested in the detailed demography of these remote ancestral populations. But the software is sort of forcing you to specify all of that. And sometimes I think QP graph fails or tells you your fit is lousy because you haven't specified the stuff you didn't care about, right? So, so, so you might like to integrate that over it in some sense. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, OK. So I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, but I'd be very happy to take questions, you know, comments. Uh, Tell me this is full of junk, whatever you want. Right?